Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, let me greet uh, all of you at the round table on uh, melting of glaciers and permafrost, a climate threat to Eurasia and the world. Uh, today I am uh, the moderator of the session. My name is uh, Yuri Shipitsin, and I am director of the Arctic Research Center of the Academy of Sciences of the Sahara Republic, Yakutia. We all know that the climate changes are one of the most relevant topics, uh, both on the regional and global levels. And our environmentalists are talking about the global climate change uh, which results uh, in the increased annual temperature, which leads uh, to the melting of glaciers and the raising of, of uh, the global ocean. So all the scientists agree that this is a global uh, challenge uh, and uh, induced by the uh, felling of trees, uh, increased emission, uh, pollution of soil, air and water. And uh, this all leads to the greenhouse effect. And the melting of glaciers and permafrost is of global nature. And the consequences uh, are seen all over the world. The forecasts uh, are related to all aspects of our life. It means the changing of the coastline, the flooding of the coastal areas, and flooding of many uh, cities in the world. So the climate of change uh, in uh, Eurasia is especially topical for the Russian Federation, because most of the territory of the Russian Federation is covered by permafrost. And melting of permafrost is dangerous. It's dangerous for infrastructure, uh, which is uh, developing in northern territories. And it is the main threat for millions of uh, Russian citizens who live in the zone of permafrost. We know that Yakutia is the largest uh, constituent entity of the Russian Federation in the Arctic zone, and the entire territory of Yakutia is located in permafrost zone with the largest thickness in the world. And melting of permafrost is a serious environmental problem for all Arctic regions. Yakutia is the only Russian region which in 2018 adopted a law on the protection of permafrost. So Yakutia has uh, the Institute of Permafrost of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Also, the Republic is uh, working on the draft uh, of the federal uh, law on the rational use of permafrost. So far, we uh, have uh, the chance uh, to change the situation and prevent uh, this threat to the climate. And uh, the fact that our round table is taking place uh, during this Congress is very important. So our task is to outline the challenges and find solutions. So let me introduce you our distinguished speakers. So we have Elena Dmitrova. Uh, she is the Vice President of the International Council on Monuments and Sites uh, from Bulgaria, who is going to speak online. Mikhail Zhelizniak, Director of Melnikov Institute of Permafrost of the Siberian branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, Davlat Hadja Itim, Consul General of the Republic of Tajikistan in Novosibirsk. Andres Oskol, Secretary General of the Association of World Reindeer Herders online. Kuneta Kasaeva, she is here. She is a professor from the University of Warsaw. She is a candidate of psychological sciences. Lena Ivanova, head of Alinyoksky Evenki Ethnic Municipal District online. And also we have Elena Boni. Uh, a representative of the local governments for sustainability. So let's start our work. And uh, the time limit for the speakers is seven minutes. Please uh, stick to the time uh, limit because we have only one hour for our round table. 
So after the uh, presentations, well, we are going to have uh, uh, a review, a questionnaire, online questionnaire. So first, uh, Elena, please, the floor is yours. Yes, of course. Yes, okay. Uh, I cannot share my screen. W will you share the screen? My presentation? Martina? Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, to wait for the screen. I hope it comes. Uh, I will start. I will start by saying good morning and good afternoon. I'm speaking from Bulgaria this morning here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, first I want to, uh, to say thank you to the organizers of this um, important forum, the 8th uh, Eurasian Local and Regional Governments Congress. Thank you for inviting ICUMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, to join in the debate. Uh, ICUMOS is an expert organization uniting 10,000 experts in the field of conservation and protection of monuments from 150 countries and with 28 international scientific committees. I'm going to use my seven minutes uh, to briefly speak about culture and cultural heritage in facing climate change challenges. I don't know who is going to change the slides. Uh, and I'm going to speak today as a member of uh, ICUMOS Working Group on uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Climate change is a global challenge of the present day, but it has many faces and brings specific challenges to different places and communities. According to a broad definition adopted by ICUMOS, culture encompasses the living characteristics and values of a community, as well as those that have survived from the past. Thus, culture provides a frame of all our action, individual or collective one. From a cultural point of view, we need today, when facing and discussing climate change, to rethink our development strategies and planning approaches, but also and before all, our lifestyles, behavioral modes, and attitudes, our relationships within society and as societies with nature. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, cultural heritage is today broadly valued and protected for keeping the traces and memories of the past. But when ICUMOS believes that it has a far bigger capacity and far more things to do today. So I'm going to briefly present a new document which has been uh, released worldwide in March 2021 uh, and which is entitled Heritage and Sustainable Development Goals, Policy Guidance for Heritage and Development Actors. The document draws upon the global scientific expertise of ICOMOS and uh, aims to demonstrate the potential of harnessing heritage to assist in achieving sustainable development. It provides practical and methodological guidance to ICOMOS members heritage professionals, but also to development actors by illustrating many ways in which heritage can be integrated into larger strategies of building a sustainable future. So it translates policy to real examples 
through case studies from all over the world. Next slide, please. Uh, what has been done actually is by in line with the five Ps underlying the 2030 agenda, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership, and the interrelated nature of the sustainable development goals, the, no the document is a call to mobilize the knowledge and resources transmitted through heritage to achieve the well-being of people. A culture and nature approach and landscape-based solutions to achieve the well-being of the planet. The shared resources embodied in heritage to achieve prosperity of communities. The shared media. on Sustainable Development Goal 13, which is climate action. And it is about harnessing cultural heritage to enhance the adaptive and transformative capacity of communities for climate action. There are several key messages there. To include heritage in climate change mitigation and adaptation planning and strategies to recognize and use appropriate heritage-based techniques, knowledge, and social organization to strengthen resilience. To promote the active participation of indigenous people in combating climate change and preserving biodiversity. To identify and promote the use of local resources and heritage-based techniques and knowledge acknowledging the adaptability of many heritage typologies for current climate action responses. And uh, as I already mentioned, each one of these uh, issues of these goals is supported by a case study. So the case study supporting the recommendations on climate action, next slide please, is about communicating climate urgency through cultural heritage. And it is about a project, a global project named Heritage on the Edge, which presents a call for global climate action using iconic and emotive heritage places to encourage meaningful global change. It is about linking global to local by concept, contextualizing climate impacts and responses in various sites. Focusing on place-based examples in adaptation and mitigation, it promotes good practice and the importance of capacity building. And what is important here are the cross-cutting themes that have been explored. The need for new tools and methodologies, climate change as an existing threat multiplier in complex landscapes, the issues of climate justice and the ongoing impact of climate changes on local communities. And to conclude, next slide, please. Cultural heritage, tangible and intangible, is fundamental to addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Yet, it links to the uh, goals need to be outlined and activated in order to enhance the adaptive and transformative capacity of communities to build resilience against climate change. 
Integrating cultural dimensions of heritage in policies addressing climate change will support the development and implementation of people-centered holistic approaches. Integrated human and natural adaptation strategies and place-based solutions which are sensitive to local culture and values. And saying thank you, I would say that we are looking forward to partnership and collaboration in this field. Thank you. Спасибо большое, Елена, за ваше выступление. Elena, thank you very much for your presentation. It is very clear and uh, obviously we do need that uh, law. And again, I would like to uh, remind you that ICOMAS is the International Council of Monuments and Sites, which is the largest non-governmental organization involved on safeguarding uh, the heritage. It's an expert organization at the United Nations with headquarters in Paris. And uh, we know that in our republic, we also have uh, the Department on Protecting the Cultural Heritage and the adoption of this uh, uh, law is also uh, for our benefit and in our interest. And the Russian Federation is going to join into this work. And now I would like to give the floor to Mikhail Zhelizniak, the director of uh, Melnikov Permafrost Institute. So please. At this Congress uh, that is devoted to finding solutions on how to adapt to changing climate. Of course, changes in climate uh, have been here and uh, there will be more. We cannot uh, avoid it. We just need to learn how to adapt, how to live with these climate changes because environment has always been changing under a number of factors. And uh, I will be talking about Northern Territories today and uh, how, how big is impact of climate change uh, on the permafrost. In northern regions, one of the specific features is uh, cold climate, of course, and the presence of permafrost, uh, which allows to exist to uh, all kinds of uh, ecosystems. And ice is very uh, prone to uh, temperatures. It can change its form, become liquid or solid, and of course it has an impact on the infrastructure, including human activities. Uh, this is current distribution of permafrost. Everything blue and green on the right is in, in Russia, and also the uh, vial, the purple one, it's the areas of uh, where permafrost is occurring. On the first slide, you have seen very thick layers of permafrost. Uh, and the distribution and characteristic differs. And uh, here, uh, blue areas uh, show different characteristics. And uh, the main, uh, of course, feature is the presence of ice. I want you to really see what is beneath our feet. What do we build our houses on? Where do we live? And what threats there might be? So these are ice complexes. This is the Arctic coastline. This is what happens when uh, ice complex is melting. It uh, is melting due to different factors, including climate change. This is underground ice in central Yakutia, where we are right now. Uh, th these are uh, uh, the most typical type of uh, 
permafrost occurrence in Yakutia. Uh, so these are some lenses of ice in between the silty layers. Again, there is an ice wedge. It can be in form of a wedge. And you can see some melted ground surrounding it. Of course, there will be a lot of uh, deformation and subsidence, but it will be, again, very different. This is what happens when uh, underground ice uh, wedges melt. So this is the form of landscape. It takes uh, 45 years. It was actually a field, an agricultural field. Now it's like this after 45 years. And uh, also uh, underground water have an impact on permafrost. And this is the map of distribution of ice uh, complex. Everything blue is uh, rock formations that contain ice. And of course, construction and maintenance of building should be very different in different conditions. So you can see on the video uh, what happens to frozen ground with uh, fine-grained, with uh, larger-grained soils. And this is the behavior of mean annual temperatures in uh, Yakutia from 66 to 2016. It's only within Yakutia. We don't see any latitudinal uh, zoning, but still, you can see the darkest points. These are areas where uh, temperatures dropped uh, the most uh, dramatically over the last years. Uh, excuse me, it, uh, the temperature ra raised in these areas. So what does it uh, say us? Uh, all of these regions uh, will be different as for their impact on permafrost melting. So if we refer to facts on the first picture, how uh, is uh, the seasonal thaw layer fluctuating? It is very important for buildings in Yakutsk. In some conditions, this depth of thawing fluctuates within this 50 years when we have this three degrees change in uh, air temperatures. In some landscape, it has a trend uh, of uh, becoming uh, of uh, the melt uh, occurring at a wider scope, but in some points, it, uh, the temperatures doesn't affect the thickness of melting at all. And on the uh, picture below, uh, you can see the behavior of mean annual temperature of ground at the depth of 10 meters. Uh, so it doesn't have a direct correlation with climate change. There are more complex processes involved. And uh, here you can see the development of thermocarst phenomenon. And uh, this are cryogenic phenomena in ice complex. The famous Batagai um, depression. And uh, next slide. A permafrost area or cryolitha zone is a very specific environment. If we talk about resilience and sustainability, we have to realize it and we have to control it. You can build and you can live everywhere, but you have to be really aware of what is happening. So what uh, our structures depend on? Here are five factors that have an impact. Uh, first of all, engineering solutions. We uh, just use one and the same permafrost engineering solutions forever. Uh, it's not very right. We have to be more flexible. Another important factor is the change of condition of uh, engineering and uh, geochronological conditions 
in process of operation. We built um, houses for decades, and we have to take it into account. And there, that's where we have to use a lot of facts and observations. Uh, construction of brand new communities uh, where they have uh, permafrost degradation processes. So you can see what happens. You have a new house, it's beautiful, but how you can uh, live in this surrounding? Uh, and these are some underwater pipelines that actually came to surface because the uh, permafrost uh, thawing processes uh, had an impact. And again, this is road deformation that we all very well acquainted with. They have to do with cryogenic processes as well. And uh, some new fresh uh, figures for you. Uh, our scientists assessed uh, the economic loss, potential economic loss until 2050. Uh, as for uh, the sustainability of structures in uh, Arctic areas. So it amounted to uh, five to seven trillion rubles. And uh, they've been discussing the system of state monitoring of permafrost. But it does not uh, take into account only permafrost. It's also environmental and geotechnical monitoring. So what do we need to do first? Continue to analyze interaction of climate and permafrost because it's very diverse. It's um, too simple to say that if we understand climate change and temperature change, we understand uh, permafrost change. Unfortunately, not. Next one is zoning of territories by the degree of possibility of different types of development. And uh, number three, it's uh, increasing quality of uh, materials uh, that are used in engineering studies. Our environment is very diverse, and there are still a lot of mysteries. And creation of this system of control over permafrost, so-called so monitoring network. Actually, it is a must for today. Uh, the change of thermal and uh, humidity regimes are crucial for safe keeping uh, structures. Another thing uh, are forests. In uh, warmer periods, and there will be some uh, colder periods too, I am sure, because I don't see a global trend. I see smaller uh, scale cycles. And, uh, of course, we have to improve our legislation and regulations. Uh, I must say that we have uh, come a long way because uh, decades ago nobody took it seriously, but now uh, people are discussing actually it uh, with a very serious attitude. Thank you very much. Uh, Mikhail, and uh, we see that your institute, besides scientific research and your expertise, uh, your institution is ready for today's challenges with the climate change, and you're ready to uh, keep on with new solutions. And uh, from the point of view of engineering, we uh, can solve these problems of sustainability. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, there are threats for infrastructure from these processes. Uh, recently, we had an incident in Norilsk where uh, hundreds of tons of fuel were spilled. 
And uh, right now, what we built for 50, 70 years, uh, the actual uh, operational life of these buildings is can be only 30 to 50 years. So this is all very important, and uh, y you made a very valuable contribution. We should implement it. And now I give the floor to the Vlad Hadja Yetsim, please, seven minutes. So I uh, received an invitation to take part in this Congress, and when I studied the agenda, and I agreed to take part uh, to get the better understanding of the challenges. Uh, yesterday we participated uh, in the work of the Congress as well, and indeed this is the platform where the participants uh, exchange information and look for joint solutions because we cannot solve challenges like this uh, on our own. And uh, the to today's topic is one of the uh, challenges which can be solved only together. Because the climate change is important for all the countries in the world. We also face uh, environmental problems. Because you know that the uh, Pamir Mountains, uh, they contain lots of glaciers. And so this topic is also very important. And our scientists have been studying uh, this uh, challenge for many years, and the governments also pay attention on this. But the problem is uh, still exists, and we cannot solve it uh, on our own. So that's why I would like to use uh, this round table uh, to uh, draw your attention and uh, to the environmental problems. So uh, the climate change uh, uh, changes lives of people and because it affects the water resources. So the, uh, the impact on the water resources uh, of course affects everyone and uh, the changed uh, water balance and uh, drying of uh, of uh, certain areas will could lead to the uh, migration of hundreds of millions of people so by 2050 people who are going to face the problem of floods uh, might increase to 1.6 uh, billion people and at the same time, about 2 billion people have uh, difficulties uh, to the water access. And by 2015, this number will exceed 2 billion people. And uh, one of the reasons will be the uh, melting of glaciers and the global uh, warming. Because uh, glaciers, uh, they are parts of ecosystems. and. The changes of ecosystems lead to the changes in the political and economical uh, structures of countries. And the problems are going to worsen. Uh, glaciers, they uh, play the, an important role in the uh, hydro regime of rivers. So the water supply in Central Asia is changing. And uh, the changes are happening not only on the, uh, on the coast, now in the Antarctic. Glaciers are melting also uh, in the heart of the continents. Uh, 
One uh, of uh, the major uh, glaciers in Pamir used to be 75 uh, kilometers long, but now uh, in the recent years it has lost already one kilometer. So this retreat of the glacier is uh, about 16 meters a year. So glaciers, they are the main source of fresh water in Central Asia and in Tajikistan in particular. So uh, the Republic of Tajikistan is responsible for 60% of water resources of Central Asia. And in the 20th century, uh, Tajikistan had uh, 14,000 of glaciers, and now we have already lost 1,000 of glaciers. So the volume of uh, glaciers um, has decreased by 30%. And in the recent years, this uh, trend is going to have some dramatic uh, consequences for the region. And so melting of glaciers has resulted in increased number of um, floods and avalanches. So we are having more and more economic uh, losses and damage. and melting uh, uh, waters from glaciers, they um, help the um, agriculture and irrigation of uh, agricultural fields. And uh, with uh, the loss of uh, melting uh, waters, uh, we are facing the real threat to the food safety of the region. Our scientists um, have uh, been doing research for dozens of years, and um, the, the results show that uh, over the past uh, 60 years, the volume of uh, glaciers uh, has uh, decreased uh, critically. So glaciers are melting in Pamir, in Altai, and other mountainous regions. So annually, uh, they are losing about 1% of their glaciers. And with the speed like this, uh, 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 by the end of uh, the 21st century, uh, the majority of glaciers uh, are going to melt. And uh, given the growing population in Central Asia and in our country, and with the decreased amount of uh, water, uh, we are likely to have uh, many problems. So that's why uh, we need to, we are taking some measures. And uh, during the conference devoted to the uh, drying of the RLC, uh, we have developed a number of measures. And, and we are trying to draw the attention and encourage uh, regional uh, and national governments to address these uh, general challenges. And recently at one of the conferences uh, which uh, was held last March, the president of Tajikistan, Mamali Rahmon, uh, covered uh, issues on water and climate. So this uh, interrelation of uh, climate and water and melting of glaciers uh, due to global warming and negative consequences of uh, glacier melting and growing population. And, uh, water provision to people of in Central Asia, increased level of the global ocean, and cooperation between the countries. And to take the joint measures to protect uh, glaciers from uh, global melting, our republic uh, and our president uh, I have proposed to announce the year 2025, the International Year of Protecting Glacier. And also, uh, he proposed to 
uh, assign a special day uh, on protection of glaciers. Another proposal was uh, the establishment of the international fund uh, on uh, protecting glaciers, which could accumulate uh, necessary funding from various sources uh, to address uh, uh, all the tasks. So all these initiatives and other measures will give us an impetus um, uh, for making joint solutions and uh, preventing um, the melting of uh, glaciers. So, and all these measures are in line uh, with the uh, Paris Convention. The participants, it is obvious that the melting of glaciers and uh, the environmental disasters related to it are uh, going to become more and more relevant every year. And we hope that the international efforts, um, joint efforts and individual efforts uh, on the initiatives of our uh, republic uh, will help uh, to protect uh, glaciers from uh, rapid melting. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Consul General. We have seen the different sides of the um, of the global warming. And uh, we see that, indeed, uh, as you mentioned, one country, can, one country cannot solve this problem alone. And um, we all uh, have reached certain results, uh, scientific results. And uh, but we study only certain aspects of the problem, and uh, when we join after our efforts, uh, our solutions uh, can become more uh, comprehensive. And now the floor goes to Anders Oskal. Anders Oskal is Secretary General of the World Organization of Reindeer Herders. Thank you, Dr. Shibitsin. Uh, thank you first to the organizers for the invitation for this Congress and roundtable that has a very timely and important topic. I also thank uh, our fellow panelists for their contributions and the researchers and institutions that are doing such important work. We are also delighted to be invited uh, especially since we've had for decades a very strong cooperation with the Saha Republic. Uh, our association was born in 1990 in the Northern Saha Republic in Topolini. Uh, and today it has grown into a mature people to people cooperation between reindeer herders. But in this cooperation, we also have a scientific component in that our research uh, institute and our International Center for Reindeer Husbandry is working with institutions also in Saha. So we are very happy to be here. Uh, the Association of World Reindeer Herders uh, unites 24 different indigenous peoples uh, spread across 10 national states and three continents. And reindeer herding as a phenomena uh, is found in the north. It's a typical indigenous uh, livelihood, way of life. And in fact, we can see reindeer herding as an original Arctic civilization in that reindeer herders are still today following our reindeer in the nomadic way of life as our ancestors have done for thousands of years. And when you look at this map of uh, reindeer herding areas, of course, there is a diversity of adaptations of reindeer herders across this map. Unique uh, topographical, geographical uh, situations. But when you look at this map, 
you will also see that it largely corresponds with a map of permafrost, and of snow, of uh, northern So cold is good for our reindeer, which are uniquely adapted to this special environment. And reindeer hoods are no strangers to variability. Uh, in fact, in my own language, uh, Sami, we don't have uh, a word for, uh, for stability. So, so our world is constantly changing. And uh, last winter, we had a really disastrous year. Uh, but this winter and spring was the best year in man's memory in terms of snow conditions. And we have a saying in uh, my language, yagi ila yahki vielya. Yagi ila yahki vielya. And it means one year is not the brother of another year. So we are quite accustomed to change, variability. But now, uh, Reindeer Hood is where I live, have faced over three degrees warming in spring pastures the last 30 years. In Eastern Siberia, in Chersky, for instance, there's been over uh, 6.2 degrees warming the last decades in, in the winter temperature. So what are the consequences of, of this change? One issue is of course that of fires. Uh, forest and tundra fires. The last, well, in 20 years, the number of registered fires in Saka Republic alone went from 260 to 2060 fires. And now it's burning not only in the southern regions, but also all the way up to the ocean in the north. This is the, some of the, the results from our research cooperation with, with institutions in Saha. And this is largely due to self-ignition, uh, thunderstorms, lightning strikes, so on. And internationally, of course, the indigenous peoples in the Amazon have gotten a lot of attention for the, the fires that have a devastating effect on their societies. But I can assure everyone that the consequences for reindeer herders are no less dramatic. Uh, there is change in snow and snow coverage. There are floods. And over time, there will be changes in biodiversity, perhaps replacing the plants and grazing resources that reindeer are uh, dependent on and adapted to. There is also land use change. And in combination with fires, this means that, for instance, in southern Sakayakutia, there is now uh, an explosion in the population of bears, which are uh, attacking and killing uh, reindeer calves, which is a very serious concern for reindeer herders. So how can we maintain our society's resilience, our society's robustness to such rapid change and shocks. Uh, when we think of the concept of resilience, uh, we also discuss tipping points. But the experience is that social economical tipping points will come before biological or ecological tipping points. So how can we then maintain cultural integrity and preserve our traditional ways of life and our unique original Arctic civilization in the future with so much change? Well, of course, science has been and will be even more important in the future. But there is another way of knowing, another way of understanding which lies within the systematic traditional knowledge of reindeer herders. 
And just to give you an example of the depth of this knowledge in the language dialect spoken, uh, Sami language dialect spoken in my village here in Northern Norway. Uh, one of our PhD candidates documented 318 terms for snow in use. So this is a deep knowledge and understanding of uh, our environment generated over generations after generations after generations. And this knowledge should also be used in combination with science so that two plus two could become five. We also need to discuss uh, the, need, the, the need to uh, focus on sustainable science. By that, I mean that science as an activity builds society. And therefore, where science and scientific activities take place cannot be a random question. We must also build the competence uh, and academic capacities of indigenous peoples when the changes are as rapid as we can see. I would also just mention uh, in the end that there is now an initiative to create the United Nations International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralism in 2026. That now comes up to the uh, United Nations General Assembly. And I hope uh, to have the support of everyone to have this go through and be accepted to have a focus on pastoralism also in the Arctic. Finally, I will say that while the changes we now see are, of course, dramatic and unprecedented in the long histories of of our indigenous peoples of the North. We should also remember that the reindeer as a species has a history on our planet that is 15 million years old. I thank you once again for the invitation and uh, we look forward to, to contribute further. Further uh, round table, thank you. Спасибо большое, Андерс, за, ваши, за ваш доклад. Действительно, мы должны понимать, что в той цепочке... Thank you, Anders, very much. And I hope that, uh, yes, indeed, uh, traditional industries, they are also affected by the global changes and traditional industries like uh, reindeer husbandry. It's another a serious threat. And uh, the joint uh, solutions uh, which come from permafrost, from uh, forest fires, they will help also to preserve reindeer, which has a 50 million long uh, history in, on Earth. And of course, uh, people in Yakutia and in, in other Arctic regions, they cannot imagine their life without reindeer and all the initiatives uh, which are done, uh, are done uh, within the Northern Forum and the fact that we have expanded our Arctic uh, zone uh, to 13 districts of the Republic, hopefully it will uh, uh, help us to mitigate uh, the consequences of uh, climate changes. So now the flow goes to uh, Kunei Takasaeva, professor from the University of Warsaw, and she's going to cover some uh, different areas as an anthropologist. So hello, everyone. And in the beginning, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this um, roundtable. And today I am going to talk uh, um, about the results of our project, which started in 2018. And so our project was uh, the International Winter School uh, Chiscan um, uh, 
which united uh, children and uh, children from Aimekon district came to this school and so they produced uh, these very interesting drawings. So which were presented at the Arctic Chronotope at the Institute of the Arctic in Yakutsk. So later we scanned uh, these drawings and uh, we created these uh, comic uh, reels uh, which can be uh, used as a teaching aid for environmental education and for uh, boosting uh, creativity and actually also the language competence. So this book was uh, partly funded uh, by uh, my university. So we, do, uh, we study the Arctic identity. I also uh, read lectures uh, on um, the Sahara Republic, uh, Yukutia. So uh, the main requirement of the grant uh, was uh, that this uh, teaching aid uh, needed to be uh, written in the Saha language. So the title of the book is in the Saha language. And so I wanted uh, this book to be used as uh, by a, as many people as possible. So they, uh, that's wh why I insisted on integrating the English text as well. So I did the translation. So here I would like to thank the organizers. Without the financial support uh, of the District Administration of Aimekon, Aimekon Secondary School, the Department of Culture of Aimekon District. Uh, they helped us a lot. And I, of course, I would like to thank children who uh, created these uh, drawings. And also uh, faculty of Artes Liberales of the University of Warsaw, and also uh, the the center for the support of the languages. We all know that uh, Aimikun is uh, a brand, uh, the bowl of gold. So uh, we went uh, there and we uh, worked on the zoning of the Aimekon district. So Chishan, uh, this is a character from the uh, Yakut mythology. So that's why um, I wanted uh, to use the creative potential of children who live uh, on the pole of code, how they see the global uh, warming. So I wanted to hear what children think. So all children uh, were very talented and uh, they were very enthusiastic about this project. And so we invited uh, teachers from the Arctic Institute uh, from Yakutsk and also from the children's magazine uh, Choranchik who uh, read lectures on how to create comics. So Chishan is a brand which is becoming uh, global because it's a uh, part of the Winter Starts in Yukutia festival. And uh, at, back at my university, I read lectures in English and in French, and I acquaint people uh, with uh, our history, with the Arctic identity, and with this character of Chishan. Uh, 
so you see that Chishan is uh, has become uh, a, a white youth symbol and I hope that our comics they will help for the environmental education as well because each of the um, series is very interesting so here you see uh, the pictures from this winter school and I, I, I would like this project to expand to the entire republic not only in Aimikon, because uh, other districts in the Republic, they also have their own brands. Just here we had uh, great support from the district administration because they wanted to promote their brand. There is another brand, uh, Labi, uh, from uh, Lake Labankir. So, uh, Children also uh, created uh, comics uh, on uh, the history of Lake Labankir, which is also in Aimekon district. And so they uh, created this uh, nickname, uh, Labi, uh, in order to promote the uh, local site. So uh, you can uh, have a look at this uh, book. And I'm going to proceed. Uh, on, uh, on the right, you can see names of uh, children. So they are aged from 6 to 15. So all the children who uh, wanted to participate uh, were allowed. And uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the art school uh, from Usnira contributed uh, the most. For example, Natalia Shkulova, who is 15, uh, that's uh, how she sees that Chishan and the global warming, you see his uh, beard is melting. And so these are the comics. So there are many uh, series. So we had li limited funding, so we didn't actually implement all the uh, all the stories. So the plots are very um, interesting. So uh, the children. Um, worked not only at school and during this uh, winter school, but also with their parents. And for example, some of the drawings are only in black and white, uh, so that children can uh, color these books. And some of the bubbles are empty so that uh, children can uh, write the words in their own language. So I tried it with Polish children and here uh, with my uh, nephews. Mm. So some of the stories are devoted to the climate change and topics related to forest fires and floods. So. Uh, the topics, uh, the stories were proposed by children, by the children themselves. So we can use these uh, drawings for the in, uh, environmental education. So Aimikon uh, is home to indigenous people of Evans and Evenki, 
and we see uh, an indigenous person who is concerned about the climate change, that it's getting warmer, and so he asks uh, Chishan to go to the sun, and so Chishan goes to the sun, and the sun says, I'm angry with uh, the citizens of uh, Earth because they pollute their own land, so that's I am cross with them, and so that's why I am uh, getting closer to the Earth, and I want to punish. Uh, and there are some space dogs, and they they live on the Neptune, and they have also have their scores with the sun. And this is a story by a ten-year-old child. So uh, well, uh, in artistic terms, it, it's it's not very good, but this story was very good. Uh, so I asked another girl uh, who draw. It was an 11-year girl from uh, Poland who draw these uh, pictures. So this is a story about uh, kindness on Earth. So this lobby, so this Labankir monster, and people come uh, there and they are afraid of him, and nobody wants to be friends with uh, him. But he wants some kindness uh, because he he wants to find friends, and so. Um, a tourist came here and uh, gets afraid, and he calls for people. Uh, so now Labi decides to dig and go further to the uh, core of the earth. And so which uh, resulted in um, the climate and the global warming. And then comes Chishan, and he restores the balance between the cold and the heat from the core of the earth. So some other drawings. Uh, so that's uh, the book uh, we produced. Thank you, Kine, very much. Uh, it's very uh, interesting. So we are pressed for time, but um, I couldn't stop you because it's a very interesting uh, outreach project. So are you going to sell this book? How can we get a copy of a book like this? Yes, uh, well, because uh, children nowadays probably don't uh, read books. and. Um, uh, so what they, they see on TV is mostly uh, produced uh, in the United States, and this is something produced here. And so children on Mekong, maybe they are not uh, that exposed to the global culture, and this helps them to uh, be so creative. So th th we published 600 books, uh, and I sent half of them here to Yakutsk by mail. So yes, the idea was to uh, make it uh, into computer game games, or, and also make some plastic uh, figurines. So maybe this is the idea for game designers. So thank you. So we have IT Park and Maitona. So we are moving forward, and Lena Ivanova uh, from uh, Alinyok, uh, Evenki uh, Ethnic Municipal District.
Uh, hello, dear Yuri Alexandrovich, dear participants of the 8th Congress of Local and Regional Governments. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you very well. First of all, uh, it's a pleasure to greet all of you on behalf of the locals of our Alinyoksky ethnic municipal district. And today here we have uh, representatives of those industries and those people who directly know how melting of permafrost affects people. Here we have some people's deputies, we have some agricultural actors, we have the bearers of Evenki language and culture. Alinyoksky Evenki ethnic district is one of the intensively developing districts of the Diamond Province of the Saka Republic. Our territory is 318 thousand square kilometers, which is one tenth of the territory of Yakutia. If we compare it to other countries, it's uh, almost equal to territory of Italy or Poland or maybe seven Denmarks. Here we have only 4,247 people and they speak three languages. And we understand that indigenous peoples are the first to suffer from climate change because their culture and lifestyle is so closely related to nature and resources. We depend on the northern reindeer husbandry, fishing, gathering, and hunting. It's not only food for our economy. It's actually the basis of our culture and life. Unpredictability of climate affects food security of nomadic peoples. And in general, melting of permafrost for our people, it's not just some theory about future, it's actually a real threat to our existence today. So what are the changes caused by melting permafrost into traditional lifestyle of indigenous small numbered peoples of Yakutia? Here beside me, I have my colleague. She started 30 years ago as a, uh, the mistress of a chum, and after that, she was uh, the director of a Safhos Brigade. And she has been noticing that pasture forages are shrinking. Over the last 30 years, Tundra has given way to forests, so pasture forage is becoming less and less. Also mentioned by Mr. Oskal, and uh, I would like to say hi to Oskal. Me and Marina, we are your colleagues. We met you in Tamponsky district. And recently, reindeer herders uh, indicate uh, that Mosquitoes and botflies are now occurring simultaneously. And even in the hottest summers, almost 24-7 reindeer are suffering from mosquitoes and botflies, which uh, is very bad for them and even causes death of calves. The third one, the longer autumn affects the mating season. If before it was started in mid-September, right now it shifted to mid-October, which leads to uh, less babies born and uh, uh, more babies born in June. Of course, they cannot get ready for migration. And there is less and less hay fields, agricultural hay fields, due to meltwater flooding. In the north, we actually don't have a lot of hay fields, but even the small number that we have uh, during this short summer, they stay flooded and we cannot make hay. Unfortunately, we have to buy hay to support our farmers uh, to deliver 10 tons of hay for
for 13 cows in a farm that is actually a source of existence of two communities. We spent 250 rubles, uh, 250,000 rubles out of this. 200,000 is transportation costs. So it's not hay, it's some kind of gold. Another thing is um, that we are very afraid of melting of permafrost, uh, which uh, brings about a possible um, wash away of uh, cattle burials, anthrax cattle, cattle burials. And uh, Alinyokski district uh, has a risk of such diseases as anthrax, brucellosis, and rabies. In uh, our district, we have 19 cattle burials that might cause episodic outbreaks of infectious diseases. Another thing is that recently uh, our district has witnessed intensive industrial development. Of course, uh, it has good points, and uh, indeed, we have an entire periodic table in the territory of our district, from diamonds to rare earth, oil and gas. But at the same time, we're uh, scared to imagine how dangerous uh, melting of permafrost can be for mines and all the mining infrastructure. This instability of permafrost might cause a lot of risks. And uh, we know that over the last two decades there were more and more um, incidents and accidents in creolithosome. In Western Siberia, there are 35,000 accidents and oil and gas pipes in Western Siberia. About 21% of them were caused by mechanical impacts and deformation. And uh, you all understand that the cause of these incidents is uneven settlement of ground when uh, permafrost is thawing, or sometimes supporting structures and foundations are pushed out when uh, the ground is freezing. Another thing is that migra migratory routes are changing dramatically. Uh, Lena Alinyok population of wild reindeer has changed migration routes. Uh, there are a lot of uh, wolves and even some new animals. In the Arctic zone, we see uh, uh, a lot of uh, silkworms. Besides, we're also very concerned with the deterioration of roads. In the north, we only have seasonal roads, and stable transportation is available only in winter. And right now, winter roads uh, start operating uh, one, two months uh, later, and they stop operating one, two months earlier because uh, the thickness of ice is not enough, and it starts melting in March already. That's what gives you only a two, three months of uh, winter road operation. And this is crucial for us because everything is imported through winter road, from fuel to foods, and everything is imported via these winter roads. The rest of the year, it's only aviation. And it gives you, again, some golden uh, goods. Dear colleagues, we really recognize the work of the Republic's leadership, all the scientists, not only of Yakutia, but worldwide, what they do for permafrost, I think, it will be successful, and we believe the recommendations that you give us today and during further meetings will serve us, uh, us, the locals of those territories located within permafrost areas, and to live in it, and uh, who hope to continue to live there. So I hope all of your recommendations will be of use for us. So thank you for understanding the urge of full and effective participation of indigenous people in developing measures for mitigation of permafrost melting. And we hope that 
the solutions that we come up with will be very useful for our territories. Yesterday, we became full-fledged members of uh, this Eurasian Local Governments Congress, and uh, I hope that together we will continue working on the successful and sustainable development of indigenous small-numbered peoples of the North who live not only in Alinyokski district, but all around the world. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. First of all, congratulations uh, for becoming a full-fledged member of UCLG. It's really useful to s for solving your everyday questions, not only from points of view of governments or scientific organizations, but for interaction and coordination with uh, international uh, communities not only financial support, uh, but also support of the uh, companies and uh, entities working uh, in your district. So if you are active, you can solve any problem step by step. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, goodbye. We now ask to join us Elena Boni, the representative of ICLE, or Local Governments for Sustainability. Unfortunately, we are so out of schedule. So um, please try to be very uh, brief. It's uh, seven minutes. Uh, unfortunately, organizers said that it's only three minutes, unfortunately. I'm trying my best. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, share. Can you see my screen all right? All right. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon to the panelists, local leaders, and who are following our session. I'm Alina Bond, um, part of the Global Covenant uh, Coordinator at ICLE, the Local Government for Sustainability, um, in a global network of more than 2,500 local and regional governments committed to sustainable urban development. Uh, now I will briefly present ICLE approach to resilient development and the support we are providing to our networks, and I will conclude with a couple of case studies. Uh, which are an example of how um, certain cities are affected by sea level rise as a consequence to melting glaciers. So this is our political representative uh, for uh, resilient development portfolio, which are uh, Manuel de Arroyo, which is the mayor of Kelimane in Mozambique, uh, Atishi Marlena, which is a member of the Legislative Assembly National Capital Territory of Bali in India, and uh, that was Sari Utama, which is the executive councillor at Melaka State Government in Malaysia. And our uh, uh, Dr. Natsmul Uk, who is uh, the head of resilience development program here at ICLE, World Secretariat. So what is resilience for ICLE? ICLE approach to resilience is about working together. It's important for communities to work with the neighboring communities, and they can be stronger in building resilience, both upstream and downstream. So. Um, is a collaboration between cities and towns and regions, which is, um, is a really important aspect for us. Um, so at ICLE, we give technical assistance to all these topics as they relate to resilience development and tackling climate change. So we bring together mitigation, adaptation, and resilience under one umbrella, since for us, it's not convenient to work in silos, and we consider all of these sectors interrelated, for instance, buildings and energy, are related as well as food, etc. Et um, so uh, this is uh, ICLE methodology applied in urban resilience strategies, uh, which is first to analyze, act, and, and then accelerate. And these are our uh, cities networks and um, uh, initiatives that ICLE is supporting, which are the cities uh, Race to Zero, Race to Resilience, the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate Energy, and the Make Cities Resilient 2030 campaign, 
And I wanted to uh, point out um, to our reporting platform, uh, which is the CDP EK Unified Reporting System, offered to cities committed to resilience. So, and then I'm gonna briefly present this uh, uh, project we have, um, which is uh, called Urban Law Emission and Development Strategy Program, a short lab, which was jointly implemented by ECLE, a unit habitat and funded by European Commission. The project has been running since uh, 2017 and will end this year. Uh, the scope is multi-level action to accelerate integrated climate action and resilience across cities uh, worldwide. And uh, there were uh, target countries in emerging economy uh, like Brazil, India, Indonesia, South Africa, and then Bangladesh, Colombia, Laos, and Rwanda. And these countries were supported by 16 uh, European cities. Um, so the urban led activities in cities were to conduct risk and vulnerability assessment and greenhouse gases emission inventory, but also commit to tackle climate change, set targets for low emission development and greenhouse gases reduction, and develop update and low emission development uh, and action plan, uh, including adaptation for benefits. So the project cities, uh, this map shows the project cities around the world. Um, we had 60 cities and eight uh, different countries. And I will quickly go to a, a case study in Indonesia of two cities, which are Bali, uh, Papan and Bogor. Um, so ICLE Southeast Asia Secretariat is supporting and guiding the review of climate action planning in, in these two cities and provided support to produce science-based climate risk and vulnerability assessment. And environmental issues emerging in Bogor and Balikpapan are floods, uh, limited water resources, coastal area degradation, mangrove damages, landslides, and rising sea levels. And um, ICLE conducted a workshop last year with these two cities to validate the risk and vulnerability assessment and review the current and future hazards uh, specific maps. And during the workshop, some recommendations were made to formulate resilient strategies, including eco drainage, water reservoirs, housing stilts, and other adaptation options for flood hazards that you see on the right side. And uh, the final goal was to assist the cities to formulate their integrated climate action plans. And indeed, the results of this assessment were used uh, to develop the plan for Balikpapan City Development Plan and also by Bogor City Government uh, for its plan up to 2024. So yeah, these were just a couple of examples, but there are many more activities that have been organized across the 60 cities involved in this project and uh, in all the project ICLEI is supporting and we are contributing to low emission and resilience uh, development. So I will conclude here and I want to thank you all of you for your attention. And if you have any questions or want more information, please get in touch with the resilience uh, development team here at ICLEI. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Elena for your short but very comprehensive presentation and uh, the internet uh, global network will allow our colleagues to uh, to know your activities in more details so we are working with you um, UCL G and we have over 1,500 uh, regional authorities in the project. So I'm going to talk about it uh, in, the, in conclusion. Thank you very much. Uh, so dear colleagues, uh, let's conclude because uh, the next round table is starting. We understand that the climate change uh, is here and to mitigate the consequences uh, uh, we need to understand that it is going to uh, change all the aspects of our life, agriculture, infrastructure, and uh, obviously healthcare system. Yes, without uh, water, there will be no health, and it's a certain threat as well. So I just wanted to say that the uh, um, uh, the um, UCLG, uh, along uh, with the mission on uh, global monitoring, uh, 
So it's a global network, network uh, the organization uh, which Elena was talking about. So people who are devoted to the sustainable urban development and they uh, take measures uh, to respond to climate change and uh, they have outlined priorities and they are working on developing uh, a roadmap for people uh, who are involved in this experiment and um, this will help us to become more effective and we understand that um, uh, maintaining climate uh, is uh, the authority of uh, uh, local uh, of uh, governments, but also scientists and all of us. Thank you for your work. Take care of yourself and your uh, relatives. Thank you. Перерыв пять минут до следующего стола. Спасибо большое всем.